Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. You know, my background is basically I've been working on weapons of mass destruction all my professional life. You know, first at the CIA, then on the House Armed Services Committee, then on the Congressional Strategic Posture Commission, you know, that looked at the nuclear strategy of the United States, then on the Congressional EMP Commission, and today I'm the Executive Director of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security, which is a Congressional Advisory Board. We advise Congress, you know, about how to protect the country against weapons of mass destruction. And the, of all the weapons and threat scenarios, you know, chemical, biological, nuclear, earthquakes, tsunamis, the things that have, the thing that has worried me always the most has been something that many people in this room may not have heard of. It's called electromagnetic pulse or EMP, and it can be generated by nature or by man. And what we're going to be talking about here today in this briefing was actually, much of it was deeply classified up until the year 2008. Uh, you know, much of this, uh, you know, was, uh, uh, was deeply classified and known only to the intelligence community and the Department of Defense until the Congressional EMP Commission decided that uh, because the civilian critical infrastructures are at risk, you know, and since the electric grid especially is the basis of our modern electronic civilization, and these are owned in the private sector, that the public, the people had to be informed and industries had to be informed about EMP so that steps could be taken to protect them. Now, in the, uh, when I was a CIA analyst, the way we used to do briefings is that first we would tell you what we were going to tell you, then we would tell you, and then we would tell you what we told you. I'll take, maybe I'll leave off that last part since I've only got 30 minutes, but I'm going to start by telling you what I'm going to tell you, and then we'll go into the briefing. And the, then the takeaway from this are, are uh, a, a few major points. You know, first, that uh, we are an electronic civilization. And uh, even our very survival, electricity isn't just a convenience. You know, we depend upon it for our survival. Uh, everything, communications, transportation, business and finance, even food and water depend directly or indirectly on electricity. And while people have the experience of temporary blackouts and are not impressed by that, if you're talking about the aftermath of an electromagnetic pulse event that causes a protracted blackout, where not only the electric grid, but all the critical infrastructures that sustain life also collapse because there's no electricity. If that goes on for months or years, you are talking about the end of our civilization. You know, the Congressional EMP Commission on which I served estimated that if we had a, a, a year-long blackout in North America, up to nine of 10 people would perish from starvation, disease, and societal collapse. If you're talking about the man-made threat, it's basically a high-tech way of killing people the old-fashioned way, you know, through starvation, disease, and chaos. And this, by the way, we know is why North Korea has the bomb, and it's why Iran has the bomb. You know, they've written about it in their military doctrine, and we've seen them exercise it. So that's the first message, you know, that protecting the electric grid and this threat to the electric grid isn't just some additional threat to worry about. It is the threat. It is the biggest threat we face, and it comes from both both nature and man. The other uh, part of this message is, and I may not have time to get into this, but hopefully I will, I'll try to dash through the rest of this, uh, is that in the end of the day, this should be viewed as a good news story, especially for Canada, you know, because we know how to protect against this threat. The military, the Department of Defense, has known for 50 years how to protect its military systems, you know, uh, missiles, strategic communications, using surge arresters and blocking devices and Faraday cages. So we ha have the technology. The problem is we've never protected the civilian critical infrastructures. The electric grid is utterly vulnerable, as are all the other civilian critical infrastructures. But we know how to protect them. It wouldn't cost that much to protect them. And, uh, and, uh, and Canada is uh, in a particularly good situation to be safe because about two-thirds of your electricity is generated by hydroelectric power, which is one of the most resilient forms of energy and easiest to protect against this threat. So you're in an even better, far better situation in the United States. We only get 6% of our electricity from, from hydropower. So I've told you what I'm going to tell you. Now let's get into the briefing and I will get into some of the details. Let's talk about the EMP threat from nature first. The sun can produce and does produce every year geomagnetic storms. And basically, uh, a natural EMP from the sun is a geomagnetic storm. 
what happens is the sun puts out these coronal mass ejections. This isn't an artist's conception. We were able to actually start photo photographing these solar flares, or technically they're called coronal mass ejections that come out of the, the, the sunspots, you know, about in the year 2012. And uh, we didn't even know how often they happen, but now we know they happen all the time. So that we're basically in a game of Russian roulette with the sun. And the little blue dot down there is the approximate size of the Earth compared to one of these coronal mass ejections. You don't have to be an astrophysicist to see if that enormous coronal mass ejection, which is many times the size of the Earth, slams into the Earth. It's traveling at a million miles an hour on average when it comes out of the sun. Uh, you know, that it can ruin your whole day. Uh, you know, basically we don't get burned to a crisp when these things hit us. It takes about three days for the normal coronal mass ejection to cross the space across space and, and, and hit the Earth because we're surrounded by a magnetosphere, a magnetic field that protects us so that the superheated gases, you know, don't actually touch the Earth. But what it does happen is that the coronal mass ejection deforms the magnetosphere. You know, it slams into it and causes it to wobble around and change shape. And from Physics 101, a moving magnetic field will generate a current in a wire. That's all an EMP is. You know, those of you who have the old-fashioned lawnmowers who used to pull on a cord to start a lawnmower know this, because what you're doing is you're spinning a magneto, a cluster of magnets that causes a moving magnetic field that generates, it moves the electrons around in a coil that surrounds the magneto. And you can see the little EMP and the spark on the spark plug. So the Earth is a giant magnet with a north and a south pole surrounded by a magnetosphere. And when one, a coronal mass ejection hits it and causes it to deform, it's exactly the same principle, except it's now scaled up to a planetary scale, so you're talking about enormous, enormous amounts of energy, electrical energy, a natural electromagnetic pulse, uh, you know, that would affect uh, power lines, communications lines, anything long, you know, that is a long wavelength phenomena. So this particular kind of pulse has to couple into large objects. It won't directly couple into your automobile that's too small. But it will couple into the electric grid, you know, which is an ideal receiver for this phenomena. And when the electric grid goes down as a consequence of this, you know, uh, the gas stations won't work, communications fail, all those other critical infrastructures, all the dominoes fall. In the event of a, of a rare phenomena called the geomagnetic superstorm, because we have, we're not worried about uh, normal geomagnetic storms. They happen every year. So we know that that phenomenon is year, but every, every century or so, we get a geomagnetic superstorm. The most powerful one known to us was in 1859 called the Carrington event. And uh, if a Carrington event recurred today, and we're overdue for one, you know, by about 50 years, because that was more than, a, you know, 150 years ago, uh, it, would, it would have catastrophic consequences for the entire planet. You know, a Carrington event would cause a natural EMP everywhere, intense enough to cause electric grids worldwide to fail, putting billions of lives at risk. We're, it, we're concerned, too, about even lesser storms, like the 1921 railroad storm that was about one-tenth as powerful as the Carrington event. Now, it only affected North America, you know, but the National Academy of Sciences estimated that if a Carrington event or a, a railroad storm happened today, such, such as has happened in 1921, given our modern microelectronic civilization, you know, that we would be in a blackout that would last four to ten years before we could recover, if recovery is possible at all. The, uh, the, uh, so we're overdue for one of these things happening, and it's estimated that NASA estimates that the likelihood is about 12 percent per decade that we will experience a Carrington-class geomagnetic superstorm, 12 percent per decade. That virtually guarantees that within our lifetimes or that of our children, we will experience this phenomenon. Now, man can also cause an, uh, an EMP by means of detonating a nuclear weapon, you know, high in the atmosphere, up in the, uh, above an altitude of 30 kilometers. And the EMP will propagate from, from the point of detonation of the bomb to the line of sight on the horizon. Uh, so the higher up you go, the bigger the field gets. The iconic EMP attack involves detonating a nu nuclear weapon, you know, at about 300 kilometers over the center of the United States. And that puts an EMP field over all 48 contiguous United States and, and virtually all of inhabited Canada 
you know, the field will go all the way up into, uh, into Canada, even if they don't intend to attack Canada, even if the United States is just the main focus of the attack, because, uh, because the field is so big, Canada will go down with us. And even if they decided to do a smaller attack, you could, you could lower that you can lower the size of the field and increase its intensity by going off at a lower altitude, at an altitude of 30 kilometers over the eastern seaboard somewhere, for example. You know, uh, the radius is about 600 kilometers. Now, that wouldn't reach Canada if you were detonating it off down in the Washington, D.C. area or in the center of the United States directly. It wouldn't reach Canada directly, but it would cause the collapse of the eastern grid. And we're on the same electric grid. You know, but Canada and the United States are, bait, uh, are operating on the same grid. And so uh, w and when our grid goes down, if it happens in the United States, the cascading effects, you know, the damage will go far beyond where the EMP field is happening, and it would bring the grid down in Canada. So either way, you know, whether it's a direct, big, very high altitude attack or whether it's a more selective attack, you know, Canada would be affected by either of those. Now, I've got Kim Jong-un up there. You know, because this EMP threat, this nuclear EMP threat is not just theoretical, but it's real. Our adversaries know about it, they plan for it, and they practice it. And this is, uh, is, a, uh, is a photograph of Kim Jong-un uh, in the aftermath of his illegal nuclear test, his third illegal nuclear test in February of 2013, when he was threatening to make nuclear missile strikes against the United States and, and, and U.S. allies. And he was in his general staff command post, surrounded by his general staff, making these threats. And the map, you can't, it's hard to see on the back of the wall, but it shows trajectories of missiles coming from North Korea going, going to the United States. And uh, the, uh, during, this was the most serious ever nuclear crisis we had with North Korea. Uh, it was taken so seriously, legitimately so, by the Obama administration that uh, the national missile defenses were beefed up and uh, the administration flew B-2 bombers along the demilitarized zone with North Korea to deter North Korea from delivering on these nuclear threats. And in the midst of this crisis, uh, North Korea orbited a satellite over the United States at the optimum altitude to do an EMP attack. Uh, it, uh, it was on a trajectory, classic trajectory, it's called a fractional orbital bombardment system. It's a, a, an idea, it was actually a secret method of making a surprise nuclear EMP attack that the Soviet Union developed during the Cold War. And North Korea did exactly what the Soviets had been planning to do in the midst of this crisis. And by the way, we, we know that Russians and the North Koreans are working together closely on their nuclear and missile program. So I suspect that this, this tactic was probably given to the North Koreans by, by the Russians. And what you do is you, you launch a, a space launch vehicle. Uh, that orbits a satellite, so it doesn't look like it's a threat. It looks like part of a peaceful nuclear program. And you launch it away from the United States, so it isn't coming over the North Pole. It's going away from the United States to the South. And you orbit the satellite over the South Pole, and it comes up from, at the United States from a southern trajectory, which is what this satellite did, the KSM-3 it was called. And this shows its track on various days, those numbers. This, for example, uh, the number 10, that's where it was on the 10th of April, 2013. And the uh, reason you come from the, to the south is because there's no ballistic missile early warning radars facing south, and there's no missile interceptors facing south. We're blind and vulnerable from that direction. We were in the Cold War, and we still are today. So you can do a surprise attack. And we basically can't defend against that, that kind of an uh, EMP attack. And on the 10th of April, this, uh, uh, or the, uh, the weapon was optimally positioned so that you could do an EMP attack that would put an EMP field over the 48 contiguous United States. On the 16th of April, uh, it was positioned so that you could put a peak EMP field over Washington, D.C. and New York City, which are the economic and political capitals of the United States, and it would have taken out the eastern grid. And the eastern grid is the most important part uh, of the, uh, that shows where the, uh, the field would have been. Uh, the eastern grid is the most important part of the, uh, of the North American electric grid. There's three parts to the grid, the eastern grid, the western grid, and the Texas grid. But 75% of our electrical energy is generated in the eastern grid, and most of our population lives in the eastern grid. So you don't even have to take out the whole country. If you just take out the eastern grid, you know, you've basically ended our civilization. And the North Koreans practiced doing both during this satellite launch. 
So this is a real threat that their adversaries know about. They've actually practiced it. This is where the generators are located. Now, the North Koreans did another thing after this crisis, around July. Uh, one of the nightmare scenarios the EMP Commission looked at was the possibility of the adversary launching a short-range missile off of a freighter to keep your fingerprints off of it. That way, you wouldn't even necessarily have to do it yourself. You could get a terrorist team to do it, put it under a foreign flag. You see, the idea most people will think, well, can't we deter North Korea? Won't be deterred by the possibility of the United States retaliating against them? Well, in the case of the satellite launch, not necessarily, because there's hundreds of satellites in low Earth orbit. And our ability to tell which satellite, was that the North Korean satellite? You know, is, uh, is very difficult, problematical, that we would be able to, re that we would have the intelligence so that we would know, well, that was a North Korean satellite that was disguised, a warhead disguised as a peaceful satellite that attacked us. Moreover, in the aftermath of the EMP, you know, it'll take down a lot of our intelligence resources, you know, that we would have. And we would probably be focused on trying to save and recover our society and have prior priority. But if you really want to do the best job of keeping the fingerprints off the attack, you know, you could do it something like this, you know, which is launch a short-range missile off of a freighter. You sail the freighter off the East Coast or into the Gulf of Mexico would be ideal because, again, there's no ballistic missile or early warning radars or interceptors facing south. The Gulf of Mexico lets, get, lets you get closest to the center of the country with a short-range missile. And that would keep your fingerprints off the attack. Could be anybody. You know, uh, there are, are 60 nations that have SCUD missiles and short-range missiles that could be launched off of the fr a freighter. The Russians are selling a, a, uh, uh, a, a special kind of a missile to our adversaries that's disguised to look like a shipping container. And uh, it could be used, if you had a nuclear warhead, you could do an EMP attack with this, with this, uh, you know, with this missile. It would turn it, convert any freighter into a, uh, into a missile launch platform. You know, you just put this missile system on, it looks exactly like a shipping container. Uh, the, uh, and, and terrorist groups also have SCUD missiles. The Houthis, back in June, demonstrated their capability to use SCUD missiles. They killed the chief of the, uh, they killed the chief of the, uh, Saudi Arabian Air Force with a Scud missile strike on King Khalid Air Force Base. So even terrorist groups. So it's a way of keeping your fingerprints off of it. And um, indeed, North Korea practiced that option too back in July of 2013, apparently. Uh, you know, they, they sent a freighter uh, in, into the Caribbean and it went, transited the Gulf of Mexico and we were not even aware that this thing was carrying missiles into our backyard, basically. Uh, until they tried to go home through the Panama Canal. Uh, it was almost like they were trying to test the limits of how capable they are. You know, uh, they got away with getting this thing into the Gulf of Mexico. Now they're trying to get it through the Panama Canal to go back to North Korea. Yeah. And we inspected it, not because we knew there were missiles there, but this particular freighter was notorious for engaged in the drug trade and bringing small arms to terrorist groups. So they were actually looking for drugs. But hidden under thousands of bags of sugars, we found that, the picture up in the upper right-hand corner, which is an SA-2 surface-to-air missile, which is nuclear capable. It's designed to take a 10 kiloton nuclear warhead. And, it, and there were two of them on their launchers, on their launchers, hidden under bags of sugar. Now, fortunately, they didn't have the nuclear warheads on them. But it demonstrated a clear capability to do a nuclear EMP attack, the classic nightmare scenario that the EMP Commission worried about, from the Gulf of Mexico. And this is not the only case where we should be concerned about the electric grid. And on October 27th, a few days before Halloween the, uh, in 2013, the Knights Templars, they were a terrorist drug cartel, used uh, conventional arms to attack the electric grid in Mexico, part of the electric grid in Mexico. And they put a whole province of almost a half a million people into the dark so they could go into the towns and villages and execute leaders opposed to the drug trade. Now, when Neanderthals like the Knights Templars have figured out that the electric grid is a major societal vulnerability, you know, what have Al-Qaeda and ISIS, North Korea, Iran, Russia and China, much more sophisticated actors, what are they capable of doing? Well, Al-Qaeda is capable of taking down a whole nation. On the 9th of June, 2014, you know, when we were all focused on ISIS sweeping through northern Iraq, 
Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula blacked out the whole nation of Yemen. You know, it, it attacked transmission towers and put the whole country into the dark. And, uh, you know, a nation, uh, 16 cities and about 18 million people. And this is the first time in history that a terrorist group has blacked out an entire nation. Now, events have moved so quickly that I wasn't able, I didn't have time to update my briefing, or at least I, you know, I actually did update it, but I put, a, put uh, this is an older version of my briefing, uh, you know, which I was giving earlier this year. Because uh, in January of this year, uh, a ter terrorist groups blacked out 80% of Pakistan, which is a nuclear weapons state. Is that preparation to steal a Pakistani nuclear weapon so that they could do an EMP attack? And then in March of this year, uh, uh, Turkey was blacked out. Uh, you know, apparently, according to the reports, by a cyber attack uh, against the Turkish electric grid. And that will be the first time in history that an entire nation has been blacked out by a cyber attack. So it looks like the, uh, uh, the bad guys, you know, are practicing taking out national electric grids by physical sabotage, by the use of cyber attacks, by a nuclear EMP attack. Uh, that's what one of the transmission towers looked like that was uh, in Yemen. And here are the EMP fields for different altitudes of burst. The outer field, I want to draw your attention to the 300 to 400 kilometer lines, you know, that would put all of 48 contiguous United States at risk. That's the, con the, the so-called iconic EMP attack, the way most people think it would be done. And obviously, it's not just taking down the United States. It would be taking out Canada as well. Now, I didn't get a lot of a chance to talk about this much yesterday, but uh, so let me take some time to go through this in more detail. And I apologize, the print is probably too small for you to read. You know, but what we are facing here is a revolution in military affairs, what Russian military scientists call a revolution in military affairs. You know, they've got a new way of warfare. You know, the bad guys, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, they've all patterned their military doctrine. Their version of cyber warfare is patterned after the Russian model. Uh, the Russian model envisions an attack that begins with the weather, something like a hurricane or high temperatures that put stress on the electric grid, you know, followed by what we consider cyber warfare, computer viruses and hacking attacks, then physical sabotage, you know, special forces teams that go in to actually directly attack EHV transformers, radio frequency weapons that have been pre-deployed or used by special forces teams that create a non-nuclear EMP because there are devices that even an individual can make that can put out an EMP field over a short distance you know, uh, less than a kilometer, but sufficient so that you can damage SCADA systems and take down and take down the grid and do other damage to electronic systems. And then the ultimate, the ultimate cyber weapon in the view of the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians is a nuclear EMP attack. That's the ace in a hole. And that is their vision of a future warfare. And they considered a revolution in military affairs that is so decisive that it would enable one civilization to replace another. And this is a theme that's taught in the Russian General Staff Academy, in the Voroshilov General Staff Academy. One of their textbooks is still, this is a Soviet-era textbook, but it was a textbook from a Major General P.A. Zhilin called The History of Military Art, which is still taught. And it goes back to the beginning of, of warfare and talks about how technology has always played a crucial role, technology and strategy, in shaping warfare so that you've had these revolutions where one civilization has been able to replace another. I don't have time to go through the whole list, but it's, to give you a sense of it, you know, it starts with the first empires, the agrar great ancient agrarian empires of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, you know, which were larger than the city-states. They were able to put more men in the field. They were able to innovate new technologies like chariot warfare. And this enabled them to conquer other city-states and then grow into empires. And so you had the, the era of city-states, the early agrar agrarian cities, replaced by the first ag agrarian empires. And that's the first revolution in military affairs driven by technology and strategy. The Persian Empire falls to Alexander the Great because he has in innovated the concept of the Macedonian phalanx, which is based on the 
sarissa, it's a spear that's 18 feet long instead of eight feet long, plus the use of cavalry in combination with these things enables him to defeat the Persian Empire. And so you have the rise of the Hellenistic Age where Greek civilization takes over the Mediterranean. That is displaced and falls in turn to the Roman Empire which has new technologies in the form of using roads, uh, the first military artillery like catapults and, uh, and scorpions uh, and, uh, their, and the formations that they use, the King Kong's formation and fighting tactics of the Roman legions uh, enables them to replace, to conquer the Greek states and Hellenism is replaced with the Roman Empire, which in turn, you know, falls to, uh, falls to feudalism. Uh, the Romans couldn't cope with the mounted cavalry of the barbarians. Uh, feudalism falls to gunpowder and, uh, and uh, the crossbow and uh, arms that put the foot soldier on an equal footing with the knighted chivalry of Europe. Uh, of Europe. And this gives rise to, instead of the baronies of the feudal area, the first kingdoms arise. Uh, which are replaced by the national armies of the citizen armies of Napoleon. And it harness, starts harnessing the industrial base, the industrial base of a, of a whole society to wage war. Uh, so Napoleon is had defeated by the British and their allies because they have to duplicate that. World War I is the first scientific total war where you have the in harnessing of modern industrial technology behind warfare. In the invention of the machine gun, barbed wire, trench warfare results in million man mass armies which are killed by the millions by this new scientific war and it causes the collapse of Victorian age civilization and the European monarchies and the rise of new systems like Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union and don't forget Zhilin is a communist and he's writing for the Soviet Union and he considers this development a good thing the rise of the USSR so that when Nazi Germany comes along with a, the latest revolution in military affairs, which is the Blitzkrieg, which uses fast-moving armor and, uh, and infantry and mobile artillery in combination with air power, you know, for the first time, a new way of warfare that was so decisive and so unanticipated by the Allies that Germany nearly conquers Western civilization, we are saved, according to Zhilin, you know, by the superior system of Soviet socialism, which the reason his book is called The History of Military Art is that up until that point, warfare is an art. But socialism is a scientific approach to, to, to all problems in human life, including warfare. And it's the superior technology and organizational capabilities and scientific approach of, of, of communist Soviet Union, which enables us to prevail, the allies to prevail over the Soviet Union. And Gielin ends his book with what to him was the newest technology, the nuclear missile age. And he was predicting that there would be a nuclear war eventually. It had to be resolved between capitalism and communism, and the Soviet system would prevail because they were, because they were, uh, they were superior in terms of their so social organization and their scientific approach to warfare. Now, we know that that didn't happen. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union collapsed because we were able to outthink guys like Zhilin and that nuclear deterrence worked. And uh, we were able to, uh, and so the West ended up prevailing over the Soviet Union. But in the Voris Yilov General Staff Academy, there's a book that follows this one, which is uh, Slip Slipchenko, Victor Slipchenko's No Contact Wars. And he's talking about this new revolution in military affairs that is the latest one and that follows and hopefully will change the outcome of the defeat of the, of the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War. And it is what I described to you. You know, it's a war that's vertical access is the percentage of critical infrastructures that would be destroyed, and the horizontal access is the hours that it would take to initiate this thing so that you would be able to achieve the defeat of the adversary. And note that the horizontal access is only 24 hours. And it begins with the weather. You know, generals throughout history have exploited the weather. In this case, I'm depicting a hurricane followed by cyber attacks as we understand them, computer viruses and hacking, kinetic attacks, attacks by radio frequency weapons, and then the ultimate threat, the nuclear MP weapon. This is important to understand because we have the same kind of failure of strategic imagination that existed just before World War II and the introduction of the Blitzkrieg. You know, we do not, most of our people who are plan, planning against and trying to deter and defeat cyber warfare from potential adversaries don't understand that cyber warfare to them is a lot more than cyber warfare. It involves all these other things. 
So part of the reason for us to be concerned and disturbed about the cyber attacks that happen, for example, China, you know, taking down, stealing 30 million, you know, files from the United States, is that they are doing what the Nazis did before World War II. They're experimenting with this new way of warfare in bits and pieces in a low profile way so that it doesn't raise our alarm so that we will be surprised when the final attack finally happens. Uh, in the Blitzkrieg, the Germans uh, had a motorcycle corps. You know, the motorcycle guys would go out in advance of the armored spearheads to look for weaknesses in the enemy's lines. And I think metaphorically speaking, the cyber attacks that we, computer viruses and hacking that we see going on, they are the equivalent of the German motorcycle corps. A lot of people say, well, you know, so what? So some Hollywood film producers get embarrassed because, because North Korea has gone in and, and, and outed a lot of their information. You shouldn't think of it that way. You should think of that as seeing one of these German motorcyclists, you know, on a hill looking down on your position. And be aware that behind him is all of this, including a nuclear EMP attack. It's a very scary thing to me when I hear about these cyber attacks happening and we have no response to them. You know, our reaction as a society, as a civilization, is kind of confusion and debate over what should we do. And have you noticed over time how more aggressive the cyber attacks come as we continue to be impotent in the way we respond to them? You know, I think it's an escalating kind of a situation. Anyway, I, I, I think I'm probably running out of, how much time do I? Okay, two minutes. All right. Let me go to the good news part of the story, <laughs> in a part of the good. Bottom line is, though, the, uh, is there is no reason for us to be vulnerable to this. You know, I want to emphasize that again. The, uh, it, there is, uh, we've been trying and, and have actually started, and some states are starting to protect themselves down in the United States. There's legislation in front of Congress, some of it that I hope will pass this year so that we can protect the grid. Uh, the state of Maine and the state of Virginia have actually taken steps on their own to start protecting themselves from, from EMP. And if you're protecting yourself against this worst threat, the nuclear EMP attack, you know, it mitigates all the other threats, all the lesser threats, EM, the natural EMP from the sun, cyber attacks, physical sabotage, severe weather, all of that can be mitigated by hardening the grid against the worst threat it could possibly face, which is the nuclear EMP attack. And it would hopefully deter and defeat this kind of a plan that uh, General Slipchenko and the North Koreans and the Iranians, you know, have, uh, have planned for us. Uh, here in Canada, I want to emphasize again that you are, you know, blessed by nature and your own ingenuity uh, with the possibility of, of protecting yourself very inexpensively and easily from this because so much of your electricity is generated by hydropower, you know. That means you don't have to worry about, well, how do I get natural gas or coal or other fuel to run my electrical generating plants because nature has already put it there. You're always going to have that flowing water that runs the hydro plant. That's a hard problem to solve and it's one of the, one of the problems that helps bring a society down because when the critical in infrastructures fail, you can't resupply those plants. So you're already starting off way ahead of the game with all that hydroelectric power and it should be relatively easy and inexpensive, much more so than in the United States, for you to protect your grid. But you must protect your grid, and I would urge you, I would urge you to consider uh, doing so. But thank you for patiently hearing me out, and I hope my uh, other colleagues will give you more of the good news when they're talking about this by talking in greater depth about solutions that I, I haven't had the time to do. Thanks again.